This is Going Under, Anesthesia Answered with Dr. Brian Schmutzler. I'm your host, Vahid Sadrzani. Of course, we're always here with Dr. Brian Schmutzler, over two decades in the anesthesia world, podcast host. We can add that to your resume now along with um, uh, all the other titles that, y- that you have, uh, including uh, resident anesthesiologist and uh, business owner. Fair enough. Yeah, that, that was a big uh, long. It could have been longer. Yeah, but that's right. Yeah, well, for the case of time, we'll yeah. keep it. We'll keep it short. But uh, Dr. Brian Schmutzler uh, answers your questions regarding anesthesia, medicine, and the like, and of course answers your questions on social media. We don't have time to answer all those questions on social media, so we're here uh, today to cover those hot topics and to answer your questions right here on Going Under Anesthesia Answered. All right, Brian. So today we want to talk about pediatric anesthesia. I know we've talked before about, you know, uh, adults and kind of how they react, but let's let's dive into that world of, of pediatric anesthesia. You know, maybe let's start with pediatrics in general, mm-hmm. right? Body compositions are different. Sure. Tolerances are different. Yeah. Um, so, so it's funny in, in medical school, they always say that kids aren't, aren't just little adults. Um, and then I, I had a general surgeon attending who used to say, but pediatricians are little doctors. So it's a joke. I'm kidding. We love our pediatricians. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so kids are fundamentally different in a lot of ways. I'm not a pediatric specialist. I do a little bit of pediatric anesthesia, but I'm not a pure pediatric specialist. So I won't get into all the nitty gritty of the differences in in all the uh, in all the anatomy and physiology, but essentially, you know, kids are treated differently than adults. Um, we don't just give lower doses based on weight, right? If if kids were little adults, we just say, well, that that kid weighs sixty pounds instead of, you know, two hundred pounds, and so we'll just give them, you know, a third of the amount we would have given otherwise. So um, we, we don't do that. Uh, we do a lot of kind of specific things in in pediatric anesthesia. Uh, so I guess the, the biggest difference, especially for little kids, is that, you know, when you go in, if you go in and you have a procedure, yep. you're going to come in and get an IV, and then we're going to take you to the operating room, we're going to help you drift off to sleep through that IV. Kids under about the age of seven, eight, in that range, we don't typically put an IV in. We actually take them back to the operating room and help them drift off to sleep through the mask. So that, that okay. inhaled anesthetic that we typically, typically talk about that we use for adults after they're asleep. The reason is, you know, kids just don't tolerate IVs very well for the most part. So, you know, you mean, I, you mean like, how do you mean, like, what do you mean by that? They don't tolerate IVs very much. So like, a kid being awake is afraid of needles, right? Essentially, that's usually what, sure. what you know, you tell them, hey, we're going to we're going to stick this needle in your hand. And they they get pretty upset about that. Um, so that sort of that break point for me, a really, really mature seven or eight year old can probably tolerate an IV. Uh, I mean, my son broke his arm when he was five, four or five, and he tolerated them putting an IV in. But I was sitting right there and telling him what was going on, and he's interested in that sort of stuff. Um, but a two year old is never going to tolerate an IV. So, um, you know, over 10, almost always we're going to put an IV in. Now, there's some instances where we have adults who either have some mental delay or um, have had some traumatic experience and will ask us to do the same thing. But the reason we're able to do it in kids instead of adults or not as well in, in adults is because kids are much easier to help fall asleep that way. So they breathe deeper, they breathe faster. And that, that, uh, the anesthetic, the gas anesthetic, the inhaled anesthetic goes into their lungs and into their bodies faster and gets them to sleep faster. Uh, and so it works really well for kids. So I would say, I don't know, probably 75% of the pediatrics that I do are just basic, healthy pediatrics, kids who need ear tubes, tonsils. Um, I did, I I hadn't done a pediatric podiatry case in about seven, eight years. I just did one last Wednesday, a little, little kiddo who had a um, splinter in her foot. And so we, we helped her drift off to sleep through the mask. And, and actually, so for ear tubes and for that case, um, I didn't even put an IV in. Okay. Um, Just, just have them had the kid fall asleep with a mask, and then you know the procedure takes less than 20, 30 minutes. We can just have them breathe on their own through the mask, keeps them asleep, and then we just stop the gas, and they breathe it off and wake up. She was funny, actually. She, <laughs> she woke up and was all giggly and funny, like she was, <laughs> like she was high or like she was seeing yeah. stuff. So that, that was uh, funny, but yeah. Um, so, so it's pretty fundamentally different. Um, we almost never innovate pediatrics either, um, at least not for kind of smaller cases, e- even uh, tonsils. A lot of times we'll, we'll just put a, uh, 
We'll put a, um, a laryngeal mask airway in, the one that sits kind of on top of the airway and not all the way in the windpipe. You know, kids do really well with that sort of stuff. Um, sure. And they, they don't tend to have um, as reactive in it as an air, of an airway. So they don't they don't clamp down, meaning, meaning laryngospasm, quite as often um, if you're just using the gas. Um, let's see, what else is fundamentally different? I mean, everything's different about pediatric anesthesia than adult anesthesia, but... Um, you know, I would say that the types of cases we do are, are pretty different. Um, again, kids usually have ear tubes, tonsils, um, really, really small kids. A lot of times will have, uh, uh, some of these abdominal type procedures. Now this is more, you know, kind of in a, in a bigger academic center, but, um, you know, we do pylorotomies, which is, uh, where, um, the, the portion of the stomach where it dumps into the, the small intestines, it, it's, it's, uh, basically hypertrophied and so nothing can get out of the stomach so they'd just make a little incision for that sometimes we'll do those those we do totally asleep with a tube in um you know some of the bigger heart cases i don't do those haven't since i was a resident but um you know those were those are where pediatric patients will be totally asleep and paralyzed and all that kind of stuff but um you know in general in the outpatient setting and sort of the community setting it's ear tubes tonsils feet stuff you know we, we had a, a question on social media. We're not jumping right into the questions. This is related to okay, what we're sure. talking about with uh, pediatric anesthesia. Uh, somebody was addressing concern about the long-term effects of anesthesia and children. Is there any long-term effects? Is there any research on that? And, and you know, what about those parents? And maybe this is a separate question, but the parents who are nervous yeah. were like, you know what, like, we, we don't know. We don't know. What What is yeah, your so, recommendation? So the literature kind of goes back and forth. I would say at this point, there's pretty good data that there is a very, very small effect, long-term effect. Now, um, in an otherwise normal, healthy kid, you're probably never going to notice that. Um, so, you know, if your kid needs ear tubes or your kid needs tonsils, you know, do it. Do the procedure. Um, now, we, I wouldn't tell you to unnecessarily have anesthesia, just like I wouldn't tell an adult unnecessarily have anesthesia. There's always inherent risks. But, you know, one anesthetic, two anesthetics, no big deal. Now, what the data definitely does show is that cumulative anesthetics lead to more long-term cognitive effects. So, um, you know, and sometimes we can't help it, right? If, if we have to do multiple, you know, a lot of kids who have um, uh, cardiac issues, there's multiple procedures that have to happen. It just is what it is. It you know, it, without those, you're going to die. So you, you've got to have those procedures. But if you look at the cumulative effect of having procedures over and over again, there is pretty good data that kids who have multiple procedures do have slight changes in, in cognitive ability later on. Mm. So all that to say, you're going to have a procedure or two. Your kids need kid needs ear tubes or tonsils. Do it. Do it. Yeah. Do it. Yep. Fix the problem. Is there is there um, you know, in terms of preparing for a procedure should parents know it's it's a little different than maybe the adult the parent getting it is there any anything different parents should do for kids than they would do for themselves prepping yeah i mean it's similar um you know and we talked about this before hydrate 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 right so kids are the same same thing right less nausea better outcomes if they're hydrated so hydrate up until the time that you've been told not to have anything else um, you know, with kids having some, uh, kids, kids metabolism is much faster. So if the kids have some sugar that day before, there's some data that, that, that may help some as well. Uh, and then trying to keep them from eating. That's, that's probably one of the bigger things that we see okay. is especially a kid who can go to the pantry and grab something for themselves. Mom and dad say, okay, you got to stop eating at eight o'clock. And then, you know, little Johnny goes down to the pantry at two o'clock in the morning and grabs something to eat cause he's hungry. That, that tends to be an issue that, that we see from time to time. Um, and then, you know, the other reason, the other most common reason that we would cancel a pediatric case tends to be that kids are sick. Um, and kids get sick all the time, right, in school and all that sort of stuff. So if there's any way to keep them healthy, that, that'll keep you from getting your, your <laughs> procedure canceled. But otherwise, it, you know, my advice would be essentially the same as, as in adults. Stay hydrated. Tell the anesthesia provider everything about the kid. Um, and then NPO, stay, stay, in, stay in away from eating. What is the, you know, if you're personally speaking about the cases you've done, 
what what are the percentages of adults versus pediatrics? So, you know, as my career has gone along, it's gotten a little bit different. Um, I, I've never been more than probably 25% pediatrics, okay. uh, except in residency where I was doing kids, um, you know, as part of a rotation. Um, you know, now I'm probably more in the 5% kids range. Um, you know, when I first started out my practice and I was at a bigger tertiary care center, I did a lot of pediatric uh, dental uh, did, did a decent amount of, of pediatric ENT, um, do much less of that now, do much more adults just because of the setting that I'm in. Um, you know, I'd say in general, just a general anesthesiologist who's not a, a pediatric fellowship trained anesthesiologist, depending on your setting, is probably in the 10 to 25, 30% range. All right. Well, it's an important topic, and I think a lot of parents want to know the information about, hey, what what does it take? Should I be nervous about, you know, giving my kid anesthetics. And I think the first question we have, uh, just give me a moment, yeah, Brian, the first question we have from, uh, from this topic and of course, general in on social media. And it's from Jackie two, two, seven, five. Fair uh, enough on Instagram. And Jackie asked the question, my daughter was diagnosed with brain cancer at 14. She's 25 now still fighting. Any long-term, we kind of talked about that a little bit, but any long-term side effects from being put under so much for three-hour MRIs and surgery? Yeah, so so um, if all this started at 14, you know, the, the development of the brain, most of it happens between the age of zero and five. And then there's obviously development from there as well. But, you know, kind of those big long-term effects of anesthesia are in that zero to five or seven range. So if she started at 14... I think your risk of long-term cognitive defects, long-term effects of the anesthesia is less than okay. had she started at two or three. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, you know, good news there. And I, and, and I'm sorry to hear that about, about your daughter. Uh, hope she's, hope she's doing well. Hope she beats it. Um, you know, um, the MRI thing is also interesting. So an MRI anesthetic, a lot of times we can do a lot lighter than an anesthetic, say for when, if she had the tumor removed from her brain. Um, you know, the, the MRI anesthetic is basically to keep the patient comfortable um, and, and asleep enough that, that they won't have an issue with whatever they have, you know, whether we do an LMA or an endotracheal tube. So, you know, I think the level of anesthesia is a little bit less in that. So I'd say overall being older and that type of procedure that she's having over and over again, I think the, I think the long-term effects of the anesthetic is going to be much less than had she had different procedures starting earlier. I think that's a big question though, too, is, you know, when you're getting those longer surgeries, um, do, you know, is there a different kind of drug that you use than the normal drugs that you use for, for anesthetics? Like, are, you know, if they're, if they're under for 8, 10, 12 hours for those long procedures, it, is the mentality different or do you go in using different types of, of, of drugs? Yeah, I mean the the inhaled anesthetics are so good now at maintaining anesthesia that unless we're doing something where we can't affect the shoot the the um the firing of the nerves and we can talk about that in another podcast because it's a whole podcast in and of yeah. itself a, a total IV anesthesia we we typically use the inhaled anesthetics for that I mean I used to do large neck dissections took twenty four to thirty hours and you would keep them on the on the inhaled anesthetic the whole time. Um, probably the biggest thing with the bigger surgeries, longer surgeries, is is uh, fluid status, maintaining okay. maintaining their fluid status so that the, they're not underhydrated and not overhydrated. That's that's the biggest complication, biggest thing that we deal with in a longer procedure. So, and there's a bunch of calculations for that, and and smart anesthesiologists who do those long cases remember that. I I don't do much more than about three <laughs> or four hours anymore, so I don't worry too much about it. But but you're in shape though. Come but on, I'm in shape. you're in I mean, shape. Yeah, right. Uh, thank you, Jackie. Two two seven five. We hope your daughter uh, gets better and is in good health. Um, Goldie sends a question uh, that asks. Not your dog. Your dog's name's Goldie, it, right? It, yes, um, it, she is Goldie. Uh, but this is <laughs> this not is that Goldie. Goldie. This is not that Goldie. She doesn't have a social media account. That's right. Uh, uh, well, she doesn't yet. <laughs> Our dog should have a social they media should. account, they though. Boy, don't give my wife any uh, ideas, Brian. I'm sure she heard it. Already. Yeah. Well, she's thought about it. Yeah. <laughs> Goldie asks, is there a way to prevent the post-op anxiety delirium? I'm going for another procedure soon and would like 
uh, to spare the docs and nurses my antics, smiley face. Fair enough, fair <laughs> enough. Uh, this goes back to something that we've always talked about. I don't mind if you're having antics in the PACU as long as you're safe, your vital signs are fine. We deal with all kinds Goldie, of stuff. Goldie, I want to know yeah, what kind of antics you're true, talking about. That's true, yeah. If, if you're punching our nurses, then it might be a little bit different. Right. But, um, yeah, I mean, in general, there are some medications that we can use that can help a little bit with that delirium. Um, you know, sometimes doing, like we talked about, the total IV anesthesia where we're not doing the inhaled anesthetics, sometimes that can help with emergence. Um, propofol is a great drug in that when you wake up, you wake up slowly, and a lot of times you wake up a little bit more clear. So that might be an option. Um, staying away from benzodiazepines like Versed and Valium, staying away from opioids, fentanyl, morphine, that sort of stuff, all those can kind of make you a little bit goofy when you wake up. But is there a silver bullet for this? No. I mean, it's just some people wake up that way. So again, as long as you're safe and everybody around you safe, I think <laughs> I think you know we're not too worried about that. Do you when you talk to the patients, do they ask, you know, what what are you injecting me with? Like what Not usually. Not usually. H have you ever had somebody that said, "Wow, I don't I don't, you know, <sighs> I don't prescribe to that or, yeah. you know what I mean? Or, and what if they're allergic? Yeah. So so that's a good question. Um, you know, we talked a little bit at least on one of the social media um, videos about propofol. So there are people who are allergic to propofol because of the soy or because of the egg allergy. Sure. Um, there's some other options. Uh, you know, we have a medication called Atomidate that we can use instead. For a while after Michael Jackson died, everybody knew that propofol was the medication he had been given. So for a while, people said, I don't want any of that propofol. So, you know, we stayed away. We did Atomidate. We did other medications, you know, um, uh, fentanyl versus... Uh, that type of stuff. You know, in general, most people who come in don't know all the names of the medications and what we're sure. going to give them. Most people just say, put me to sleep. I don't want to remember anything. I don't want to feel anything. You know, okay, we can, we can handle that. <laughs> um, yeah, but it, it, there are almost always medications that we can substitute if you have an allergy. So, I, I mean, I can't think of a single medication that we can't substitute if you have an allergy. That's good news. Yeah. Nothing to be worried Modern about. Modern anesthesia. The, the last question we have uh, is, uh, here it is. I've been told that anesthesia feeds into dementia uh, in older people. Is that true? Yeah, so, so it is kind of true in, uh -huh. in a way. Um, you know, really what predicts whether you're going to have long-term dementia or cognitive defects from an anesthetic, you know, we already talked about the number of anesthetics you've had, but if you come in with pre-existing cognitive defects, that's that's what's going to predispose you most likely to having worsening dementia afterwards. So if you come in, you've got Alzheimer's, you've got Parkinson's disease, you've already got some sort of dementia or memory loss, having an anesthetic is likely to exacerbate that, maybe in the short term, maybe even in the long term. So that's that's generally what we tell patients who come in who already have dementia. You and I, we don't have any cognitive defects. Well, I mean... My wife might say I do, but anyway, <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, you know, somebody who comes in without any previous dementia, yeah, yeah. cognitive defects at all, you have an anesthetic, you're not likely to have any, any long lasting effects. So, I mean, like somebody like, you know, my father who has Parkinson's, mm -hmm. you know, he's 83. Let's say he needs surgery, emergency surgery. Yeah. What, what is the, you know, I mean, like, and I think we had a question on social media on this, like, Hey, what's the likelihood that you don't wake up or like what's the what are the complication percentages? Do they go up? Yeah. Um, I mean, the complication percentages go up based on age just because we get sicker as we get older. Um, but, you know, the fact that he's already got Parkinson's disease, if he's got any memory defects from that or issues from that, then it's likely to get worse after surgery. OK, the question is, and the data doesn't really spell this out very well. Do those do those changes or increase in dementia last six months? six weeks, a year, five years. We don't know. Right. Um, and it's different for every patient. We're not sure why, but I always tell older patients who come in with some sort of dementia, I tell the family members, you're going to notice that he's going to get worse for some period of time. It may get better. So, um, but there's definitely, definitely evidence that having preexisting dementia results in, in worse dementia after after anesthesia. Well, thanks so much, folks, for these questions. It, we really do appreciate you sending them in, yeah. and Brian reads every single one. I do. So uh, Dr. Schmutzler is on it. If you send a question on Instagram or uh, any of the social medias, really, uh, TikTok especially, and uh, Instagram uh, and Facebook, of course, uh, send your questions in. And we've gotten a few on the website, too. It's drbrianschmutzler.com. Uh, 
what we want to uh, touch on here, Brian, quickly before we wrap this uh, episode up is if there's any updates to this medical health uh, system scare, maybe, you know, I know we did a TikTok about it yeah, uh, and social media posts about it, but if you want to kind of explain yeah. what happened again and then maybe touch on any updates if we have any. Yeah, so um, this would actually be good if we can if we can take this portion and throw it up uh, on, as a reel as well. Um, so just, just a little recap. Uh, there was a hacking of Change Healthcare, which is the largest... Um, sort of depot or clearinghouse for medical claims. So not only going out, medical claims going from a facility or provider to the health insurance companies, but also coming back through and the healthcare providers getting paid. So um, there was a hack on February 20th, shut down the entire system. Uh, so no claims have been able to go in or out of Change Healthcare since that time. Um, I would say most of the insurance companies and most of the uh, billing companies have gone away from Change Healthcare. Uh, Change did just put something out, I think this weekend actually, where they said they're going to be back online by March 18th. The problem is in talking to both sides, insurance companies and the, and the billing companies, uh, nobody trusts that it's secure. So everybody wants an independent audit and all that sort of stuff. So I, I don't think anything's going to be repaired in, in, the, in the short term for sure. Almost everybody's gone to other clearing houses at this point, which which is probably good. Um, there was also a couple articles about how the hackers were paid. I think it was twenty two million dollars, and we can throw that up on the on the screen uh, if we do a reel on this. But um, and so so they I guess it was um, ransomware, and the, they paid the hackers twenty two million dollars. The problem is, <laughs> okay, you've paid them these twenty two million dollars. How do you prove that that system's now secure, even though they're not in it anymore? So. Um, I, you know, I, I think this goes to a couple of points. Uh, number one, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Um, you know, it, change healthcare being clearing house for a huge portion of, of the claims in the United States is just a bad idea. Um, and, and then the other, the other issue is why are we so dependent on a clearing house mm -hmm. to do all this? You know, why, why can't we just send our claims directly to Medicare, send our claims directly to United Healthcare or whomever? Uh, so p putting this intermediary in and then um, Medicare now refuses to take any paper claims and some of the private payers do as well, uh, which to me doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, I'm in a hospital. If I have to write orders and the, and the computer system goes down, I have a paper chart I can write orders on that we use on our downtime. You know, in my opinion, all of the payers, including Medicare and Medicaid, should be doing that as well. That would have fixed this problem like that. We could have shifted right over to paper claims and we wouldn't be out all this uh, revenue. Um, trying to think what else on this topic. Uh, you know, um, <laughs> the parent company of, of Change Healthcare, which is Optum, also uh, started um, the advanced payment uh, processing, which is similar to what they did during covid uh, it's funny, though, the majority of people are getting less than 1% of what they would have received had they actually been, been processing claims. So it's kind of a drop in the bucket. I mean, it was more of, in my opinion, more of a PR um, PR play than it was truly trying to help help those of us out who who run revenue through through Change Healthcare. Uh, so overall, it's, it's a huge deal. And it's unfortunate, I think, that nobody in the media is really talking about this. I mean, you see an article here or there, but... Why do you think that is? I, I, Without being a... I, I think there are um, forces at play uh -huh. that are suppressing it, in my opinion. Um, How many clearing houses are there? I mean... Like, oh, there's a lot. Okay. Um, best guess, 25 or 30. Okay. But change was by far the biggest. Um, right. You know... Some people say 40%. I've heard somewhere from 60 to 75% of all claims in the United States are run through Change Healthcare. So, um, and, you know, take what you will from it, but they're owned by Optum and United Healthcare. So, right. Um, all right. Yeah. Well, it's a good update. And we'll, we were going to touch on uh, kind of the healthcare system in general and, um, you know, the, the payments yeah. and, and more of the financials on our next uh, podcast. So that's going to be a, a really, really good one. Uh, and if there's nothing else here for this, wrapping up this one, you know, I think we had a good good session here today. Uh, talked about pediatric uh, anesthesia, which is a very important topic. 
and uh, answered some of your questions. And again, if you have a question for Dr. Brian Schmutzler, don't be afraid to send it in. We've seen the comments online. I mean, he, just, just send them in, comment on a, a post, uh, or go to his website, and uh, his uh, email is right there. Uh, comes to him, and, and he'll read it, and uh, we'll answer it on the air. Sounds good. All right. We'll see you in the next one. Thanks. Thanks.